no problem. Okay, if I ask everyone just to keep on mute, that would be great. Um, I'm also really pleased to introduce our community leader, Elena Dimitri and Karina Faria, who are going to be talking to us today. Um, Evelyn Okoto, who's cabinet member for Southwark Council. Uh, Martin Wilkinson from the Integrated Care System for South East London. Uh, Ezra Standing, who's a young person joining us today. Claire Dimond, who's a CAMS consultant at South West London and St George's. And Annika Clark, who's also a consultant psychology and psychotherapy lead at South West London and St George's. So we're so grateful to have Elena Dimitri today, who's a community leader, and Karina Faria joining us to share their story. So I'll stop talking now and I'll hand over to them. Uh, if you are here, um, please do put your camera and your microphone on. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Ellie from Parents and Communities Together Pact. Um, we're a community-led project which has been set up to empower parents um, supporting their mental health and early years development of their children. So I'd like to invite Karina, first of all, um, who is one of our amazing parent leaders from PACT, to share her experience with mental health during this pandemic. Hello, I'm Karina and um, I'm one of the volunteers with PACT. I've been volunteering for about a year um, and I joined after I had my second child. Um, before then, I had suffered from mental health anxiety and depression, and being part of PACT has really helped get over that. But during the lockdown, it's kind of brought old fears back. Uh, a main one is um, my anxiety over if anything were to happen to me, what's going to happen to my kids. Um, and I think a lot of parents feel that way, especially when you, you're not sure about um, the whole uh, pandemic. Um, also, a lot of depression feelings, feeling low, um, frustrated, um, and having to deal with that myself, old face coming back. Um, I've also, ha also had to deal with my oldest child, who's 11. And she was going through her mood swings and pre-teens issues, um, not being able to go to school, seeing her friends, um, her first period, her, the whole mood swing going up and down. So it was really like a roller coaster. And being not able to see my friends or being having access to the su support that I had with Pat, um, I felt really I isolated. And having um, people that I trust from Pat calling me, asking me how I am, it kind of brought back that I'm not alone. I do have support and it's really helped me as well uh, to give support to my issue that um, I found uh, talking to other parents is um, practical things like how do you educate them? <laughs> Um, your kids, especially if you have more than one child. Um, I've got friends who had four, five, six ch children. I've got three myself. And I found it really hard and I struggled a lot to be in a place where it was overcrowded because we're in a two bed flat and there's five of us. And trying to manage everyone's emotions plus my own. Um, and it was just, it, it was very claustrophobic. And you can't get away from your personal circumstances. Being overcrowded, having more than one child, kind of being spread thin. So I had to find other ways to deal with that, being locked in a small flat. So um, if picking up on practical things like making sure that everyone has their own little space, uh, making sure that I I had found some sort of uh, personal space as well so I can go and have that rest because when you're locked in a, in a flat five people around you 24 7 you don't get any personal space so um having the ability to talk um, I have just lost Karina. Yeah. 
Uh, I think we lost you for a second, Karina, but thank you so much for sharing um, your experience. And um, I think uh, Karina is definitely not the only family in our community that's faced challenges like this during the pandemic. Um, we've actually already started our listening campaign and have um, so already hearing about how it has exposed and intensified the situations of a lot of the families. Um, external things like Karina mentioned, overcrowded housing, limited access to food or um, financial support, inability to connect with um, others have definitely been highlighted and lead to feelings of isolation, social isolation, fear of getting ill or getting the family ill, anxiety, low self-esteem and a lot of feelings of guilt associated with letting your family down. Um, being trapped indoors, bored, unable to take your kids outside to play with others. Um, I think it's really clear that these circumstances and um, the feelings and experiences of poor mental health are completely connected. Um, so I'm really pleased that the task force is prioritising listening to parents and really, really excited to be involved in this listening. Um, and. 100% agree with our ambition to work with families impacted by the pandemic. So, lovely. Thank you so much, Ellie, and thank you so much, Karina. That was um, that was a, a really moving piece there. Um, I'm now going to go to our panelists, actually, and and first and foremost, I'd like to uh, to ask Evelyn Okoto to briefly rearticulate the aims and purposes of Theme Five, if that's okay. Evelyn, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. And, and I want to say a big thank you to everyone that is here. Um, it, and it's important to say that, uh, you know, myself and Martin, who is a co-chair, um, co um, are not experts in the field, but we helped and supported a group um, to develop our ambition. And Martin will be talking about uh, our ideas around that. So in summary, our ambition is about the importance of having a family-centered approach. The need to consider individuals within that family, um, and a family unit can be, you know, constructed you know, as closely or as loosely as, as you would like it, um, and when assessing needs. We recognize that we must listen and work with families, children and young people in genuine co-production if we want to ensure our ambition is both meaningful and effective. And I think you see on the screen now what the, the summary of um, our ambition for um, theme five. So I won't read it out and I'll, I'll hand over to Martin. Thanks Evelyn, and my thanks as well to everybody for joining in today. Uh, it's been a real privilege to co-chair the, um, this, this work stream uh, and it's really moving to hear the stories, uh, Macarena. Uh, so my thanks to, to everyone that shared their stories so far. What we do want to do and some of the ideas we have, we didn't want to actually come in and design you know, what the solutions were because that's really important. Evelyn and I and, and the task force don't really know what the issues are uh, to then go off and design those. So we want to really work with the local communities, work with families, work with children and young people to design and think about what solutions might be that we can uh, work on together. So we want to engage in this listening exercise through the South London Listens uh, with children and people and where families are. So the, uh, as a comment in the chat about schools, so actually we do, you know, one of the venues would be going to schools. Um, but the second uh, idea for us was this then co-production. So working through uh, solutions, thinking through how actually we share information, how we uh, work and signpost people to the sort of support that might be available and how we uh, put that forward, what, what platforms and, and tools we use to share that uh, because everyone receives information in a different way. Uh, so they were some of our day ideas, but really it was about engaging with people, empowering people to think about solutions for themselves, but also how the services we support people uh, going forward. Thank you, Martin. And I'm just going to quickly bring in uh, Norman and Vanessa here just to give us a very brief um, overview of why this work is important from a mental health perspective. Uh, shall I go to Norman first? Uh, thanks a lot, um, Olivia. Well, I think, to be honest, Karina uh, and indeed Ellie uh, demonstrated so clearly why this work is so important. I mean, that description we got from Karina about the experience of going through lockdown and you know that's just repeated so many times across our communities uh, and what do we do just stand back and wait for things to unravel and for crises to develop or do we work with communities critically as martin has just said listening to communities 
to work out what they need, what the challenges are that they're facing in real practical terms. Uh, and so that is the value of this exercise. And, you know, I, I'm very positive that uh, our Mental Health Trust and indeed South West London, I see Vanessa on the screen in front of me, and also Oxley's are all taking this approach that we shouldn't just sit back and wait for, you know, demand to hit us. We should be out there collaborating with others, working out solutions to support communities to cope with the challenge we face. The only other thing I would add is that I think it's really important that we focus on year zero onwards. Uh, you know, there will be uh, babies born during this period uh, and uh, mums and dads who will have experienced really difficult and wholly uh, exceptional experiences in those early years. And so supporting uh, parents, it seems to me, finding out what their needs are uh, must be included in the work that we do, but the right way to do this is to go out and listen to communities, to people. Uh, and that's why I'm so positive about this initiative. Thanks, Norman. And Vanessa, did you want to come in on that as well? So I think the, the, the stories that have been so generously and heartfelt shared with us today make this work so real. Um, and I think we need to be really careful that we don't pathologize mental illness and that actually the experiences that so many of us have had during lockdown, the ability to speak, to enable communities to talk to each other, to connect to each other, and for people to access mental um, health support at the right level, in the right place, as close as possible to them, for them and their families, is would be transformational in making this real. Um, and I think it's about making sure that we enable the communities that we serve rather than uh, us rather than mental health trusts or people thinking that we know best because we don't. Um, we've got to keep it real, haven't we? And I think those stories today helped us to do so. So thank you. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, now I'm going to bring in Ezra, Claire and Annika here. So we have a young person and a counsel consultant and a, a psychology and psychotherapy lead. And I would like to ask you, how can we be more creative about hearing the voices okay. of children and young people? Is, uh, do we have Ezra here? No, nope, don't have Ezra. Uh, we've got Claire here. Claire Dimond? Yeah, yeah, no, I'm here. Hi, Claire. Hello. So, yeah, the question was about how can we be more creative about hearing the voices of children and young people? Do you want to go, Annika, or do you want me to go? Go on, Claire, you go. I'll bring Annika in in a minute. Um, I, I guess my first question back, which is not avoiding the question, would be, um, is, is, is it Ezra? Is she, is she here? It's... I can't see Ezra. I, okay. I, Ezra was unable to make it today. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I guess my first question, which is not avoiding the question, would have been what Ezra's views and thoughts were about that. Because I'm guessing, since she's asked the question, that she's got some ideas, thoughts in her head, maybe. Um, I mean, the way, the way I was looking at it is involving young people families at an individual level. So obviously I work with a lot of young people's families. So making sure that we always have that collaborative, transparent, multi view perspective and, you know, every interaction that we have, um, obviously developmentally, depending on the age of the child, but, you know, whatever significant adults in their lives, getting all of those views, teachers views. Um, and then involving young people and how, what interventions, how they want it. You know, at the moment, we're talking a lot of about to young people about do they want direct face to face? Do they want phone? Do they want to attend anywhere? You know, and why they might want those different ways of working. Um, and then it's involving young people in how we set up services, isn't it? I guess where the services are, are they in schools a lot of our services and Annika can talk to that but we're providing huge numbers of services in schools now um, which is what some young people want but not what all young people want it's all going to be very very individual isn't it about what different young people and families want um, so thinking with them about service development and how we develop services um, and I think there's a participation officer, I don't know if she's here, the South West London one, but also within the local CAMS, because again, every borough is different with different services, different voluntary sectors, different statutory services. So um, certainly Sutton, where I'm based clinically, we have a young people's participation forum regularly. 
so that's young people that are using services but I think it's also really important to get the voices of young people that aren't using services so I come from working in a secure unit and I can guarantee you that none of those young people had really ever access services so you know how do we get their voices in as well basically rather than the young people that are accessing services um, so I'll be quiet now I think I've probably said enough thank you Claire Annika did you want to come in on this question sure I think um, one of the challenges is making sure that we get a wide variety of young people's voices I think sometimes that the um, um, schools push forward for example young people who who um, haven't always necessarily signed up for it but schools have got an idea that they'll be good to give feedback and I think it's really important to make sure we've got um, the idea out that um, mental health is for everybody and everybody has a view and to really encourage young people even if they don't think they have anything particularly meaningful in the moment that that they through discussion you know everybody has good ideas and I think the other thing that's really key is that we have to show we act on what we're hearing so I think it's all very well to elicit views and to ask people about and young people what they think and how we can improve services but they very quickly um, don't want to participate if they can't see that anything they're saying is being acted on or thought about so I think it's really key to have a feedback loop to show that not only we're asking but we're listening and responding too. Yeah. Thank you so much um, we've got another a, a question here which um, I might put to to Claire and Annika again actually but but Evelyn Martin and, and Norman and, and Vanessa please do come in um, it's a question that says adverse childhood experiences are a defining factor in some children's adult mental health how can you improve access to much needed children's support systems so that they can be supported into adulthood even if their childhood is being affected by the adults around them now I know that's quite quite tough are there any volunteers from the panel who can come in on that I, I can make a start and then maybe others can follow um, so I think we talk a lot about resilience and how we can improve people's resilience but of course it's impossible to be resilient when the factors around you are all against you so I think looking through the six ambitions that were pulled together for this summit um, they all acknowledge the impact of economic social and environmental factors on young people and their families. So I think that's the first thing to note is that it's impossible to be resilient when it feels like everything is against you. It's a normal reaction to feel overwhelmed. And I think resilience isn't one thing. It's a multi-layered um, concept really. And I think it's linked to feeling supported, feeling like people are trying to understand your position and be there with you, feeling like you have some element of control over what is happening to you and that if you don't feel you have any control over it that um, there is some realistic hope that things will change and that you can have a say in what's going to happen to you. Um, so I think confusion in the systems around young people and families don't help but I think one of the things that we can all do is even when situations feel really difficult is to help help families and young people feel that there are people around them who want to listen, want to understand, want to support, and also to be able to hold on to some realistic hope. Uh, it can't be pie in the sky thinking, but some realistic hope that, that change can happen and the steps to take to how to get there. So that, uh, you know, none of us feel good when we feel like we don't have any control over what is happening to us and around us. So I think, you know, it's all very, I see a lot of programmes talking about how to build children's resilience. And I think that's the one way around it. I think it's not something that you can expect people to just have. It's something that's built on and layered uh, and it involves a lot of the systems around people, if that makes sense. Thanks so much, Anika. And does anyone else from the panel want to yeah, comment on that? We've got about two minutes. Yeah, can I just join in? And I think um, it's important to, to highlight that while the recommendation or the, the kind of what we're talking about, it, this guide supports a family centered focus. This should not be alternative to individual care. Um, and we must basically consider this alongside the kind of support we have for either the parent or the carer and the child himself. And I think 
being able to support a child into adulthood is about holding that child as they're going to adulthood and making sure that the systems or the departments link hand. What normally happens is that when a child goes into adulthood, mm -hmm they're obviously dropped. And then now they have to start finding where, where the adult help is. We have to ensure, especially when it comes to mental health and issues like this, that we hold the child from that, that, that kind of childhood element to when they grow up into adulthood and ensure that they are kind of released when they're able to cope by themselves and not have that break that we seem to always have, seem to have now in the system. Thank you, Evelyn. And were there any final comments on this one? Yeah. Well, just very quickly, Olivia, uh, we all know uh, the link now between adversity, you know, difficult, challenging things happening in childhood and then the emergence of mental ill health later on in life. Uh, and we're not good enough yet at uh, supporting families to prevent those things happening in the first place, but also to support them when they do happen. Uh, there's a great uh, uh, organisation which is called EPIC, empowering parents empowering communities which works in south london doing a lot of this really valuable work with families and we should make sure that we link in with them because they understand the science of this and if we can apply their understanding to support more families through south london then we could do something very valuable i think thanks norman Catherine Grant in the uh, chat here has said Annika is making a, such an important point about resiliency and I completely agree about the importance of feeling an element of control and hope. Thanks Annika. Um, I'm afraid it's now quarter to two so we're going to stop for a four minute break now. We've got a short film to show you so please do take this opportunity to go and stretch your legs and let's film time sitting down. Uh, so we're going to show you a short film and then we'll be back at ten minutes to two. Thanks. I'm really a single mom with three children, I don't really have any more income apart from universal credit. So COVID have affected me very badly. And emotionally, mentally, I mean, physically, financially, in all of the way. My entire life purpose for the last few years came crashing down in a matter of seconds with Boris Johnson's announcement about closing schools and cancelling exams in March. Young people lost their friends, their education, their futures, the people they confide in, their escape and their distraction from everyday life, all instantaneously, and were given just two days for some kind of closure. I recently had a conversation with a young woman who's a black mom, single mom, has a six-year-old son, and lives in a house that she's been completely upset with. And I think what COVID has done in terms of my own my engagement with community groups is really exacerbated pre-existing issues, issues around housing, issues around poor access to mental health services and so forth and so on. For me, good mental health um, is, is really all about how do we support people um, and families to uh, retain a sense of, of well-being and positivity and optimism about the future and that's going to vary enormously uh, depending on individuals and their circumstances and the challenges that they're facing um, and of course it also has to mean being there when things feel just too too difficult too challenging and when problems are starting to develop before they get so bad that they they push people into crisis i'm supporting this program to protect our communities and mental health because covid 19 pandemic brings all types of feelings of loneliness, mood swings, anxiety, we all need somebody. Reach out to family and friends, people like us, we're here to help you. Hi, I'm Ellie from PACT and I am supporting this program to protect our community's mental health because the pandemic has exasperated many of the challenges um, that were already being faced by families in our communities. This is a great opportunity to better understand how we can support the most vulnerable and enable them to access services that are relevant to them. We're working together to help protect our communities during the pandemic. In this summit, we'll help to shape our vital plans. Hi, I'm Priya. I work for the Monsi Charity. Good mental health to me is maintaining a balanced attitude, a balanced approach, uh, not to get too swayed by 
what's happening outside, what's going on in the country, in the world. To think that we are all in this together and we have to get out of this together. Hello, I'm Chris Best. I'm the Deputy Mayor for Lewisham and the Cabinet Member for Health and Adult Social Care. I've just been amazed at the work going into this programme. It is so important and I believe that every resident should receive the help and support they need and we must work together to make this a reality. Hello, my name is Leila from PACT and I'm supporting this project because I think good mental health is the cornerstone of a healthy society. This summit is important because it brings stakeholders and communities across South London together to focus on promoting and protecting mental health, a topic which is often stigmatised. So giving people the chance to come together and not only openly discuss, but to have a say and help shape the future of mental health in their communities is something we should all be doing. I find that hearing and reading about the way other people have navigated their way through mental difficulty and distress as I do every day here at Bethlehem Museum of Mind, is really good for my own well-being. Hi, my name's Minnie and I'm from Parents and Communities Together and I support this project because the first time we went into lockdown, uh, we were just surviving and we forgot about key important things like mental health and it's important that we don't do that now. Thank you, Angus, and welcome back, everyone. Um, just uh, let's just wait a couple more seconds so we know that everyone's second in the room. Um, I know some of you have had problems sharing messages on the chat function, and a lot of them are just coming through to me. Um, I think this is a glitch with Zoom, unfortunately, but don't worry, any comments that you make, we will be collecting and we will be working with them and, and, and taking them all into account. So none of your comments are are getting lost um it's just other people won't be able to see them which i know is a bit of a shame um we're going to start start the second half now um and there's never enough time for these things so i'm sorry if we're rattling through quite quickly um we're now moving on to theme number six um and i will introduce the panelists we have a uh, norman lamb again and vanessa ford again which is great i'd like to introduce you all to amy scammell the director of strategy and commercial uh, development at south west and st george's chris best who's a deputy mayor of lewisham Jonathan Campion, who's a consultant at SLAM, and Ermias Alemu, who's chair of the Membership and Involvement Working Group of the Council of Governors at South, at South London and Maudsley. So we don't have a community leader uh, conversation for this, but what I'd like to do is to bring in uh, Jonathan Campion on developing long-term approach to prevention. Jonathan, are you there? I am, yes, thank you. Thanks, Jonathan, over to you. Yes, thanks. So um, it, it was fantastic to be part of this group and uh, I thought we worked very well together. And, and I guess what we did, first of all, was to outline the importance, which I think is just very helpful to just briefly summarise that mental health conditions account for at least a quarter of UK disease burden, which COVID is going to increase. The good news is that we've got effective interventions to prevent mental health conditions from arising, to prevent them from reoccurring and also to prevent a broad range of impacts that otherwise occur. And we've also, we've also got effective interventions to promote well-being and resilience, which can also prevent uh, mental health conditions. And these interventions are provided by different agencies, which add complexity. Um, in England, however, even before COVID, only a minority of people received any treatment. The coverage of interventions to prevent associated impacts much less, and hardly any um, implementation of, of, of of interventions to address risk factors or promote well-being. So I think that's a helpful context. So of course it makes it even more urgent to, uh, to actually implement. Um, and so I think that the, 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 the work of the subgroup was kind of looking at how can we facilitate um, improved coverage to support a, a coordinated, sustainable, integrated, long-term approach to uh, promotion and prevention. Um, and that obviously mitigating the impacts of COVID. So we came up with some uh, suggestions, but I, I maybe I could leave that to other uh, other speakers. But I'm happy to add my my tuppence worth if that's helpful. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, now I'm going to bring in Amy and Chris and Ermias as well um, to briefly rearticulate our aims and purposes for the for the theme number six. So do we have Amy? 
Hi, how are you doing? Hi, Amy. Thank Hello. You. Thank you. Um, so thank you so much to Jonathan for um, giving us a bit of context. So really, um, it took us quite a long time to come up with our aims and ambitions because we have so many great ideas. We really struggled to pin it down. So I guess the key thing for us is that there is already quite a lot of information and evidence available, as Jonathan said, about what works, about what will help all of us um, support our own mental health and well-being and support those of our, our communities, our families and friends. Um, so what we need to know is what works and then what can we implement? Um, so the first thing is to make sure that we know what works and that people have access to that across South London. We also want people to have confidence to know that the support that might be offered can have a very good chance at helping them and supporting them. And then also that our communities feel empowered to um, connect and support the connection of others through those um, programs or packages or projects or pieces of work that we know support mental health and well-being. So, so we did eventually get there and pin it down to sort of three very sort of precise statements, but it did take us quite a while. And um, yeah, it's really about thinking about the long term, embedding what we know works, and then supporting one another to connect, really. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Amy. And Chris, did you want to come in on this? Thank you. Um, as Amy um, has just said, it, it was really the fact we've got an awful lot of information. But for me, it was about working upstream. It's about getting ahead of the game because too many people leave it and therefore the problems just get worse. So I'm very interested in what we can do to signpost and it's high quality information. We must target what really does work and it has to be of quality so people come and sustain that. We need that resilience. So it's really working upstream, getting the information out there, bringing people in earlier and working on a co-production, a co-development program that benefits our residents. It's really, we've got to listen to them and what works for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Amias, did you want to come in on this one? Uh, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, just to reiterate, um, so it's about having um, a whole population um, approach in terms of public mental health. We usually focus, when we talk about mental health, we focus on mental illness and the crisis um, part of it, but it's, as we know, mental health is a continuum. So. Um, um, we need to uh, target people who are at risk, uh, at high risk, also uh, working with people who already have development health problems, but supporting them not to have um, even worse uh, problems. So the importance of prevention has been, uh, has been highlighted in terms of reducing mental illness, also improving pop population mental well-being. So this effort requires a, a whole system approach. As we know, mental health, the factors, psychosocial factors are, and the social determinants impacting on mental health are really, really uh, system-wide, education, health, social housing, unemployment, and all that. So it would require all agencies and all departments to collaborate on this in order to prevent. And also what COVID highlighted is the already existing inequalities in the society but it actually magnified it. So we just have to address inequality, especially those who are disadvantaged uh, because of uh, the factors. Thank you very much, Amias. And we have, we've got a point in here from, um, from someone who said, evidence needs to reflect the needs of hard to reach groups, i.e. those from BAME backgrounds. The needs there might be niche and can affect people's abil ability to feel confident in accessing support. So that's a, um, if anyone wants to come in on that point, um, please do. How do, we, how do we make sure that hard to reach communities are reached? Jonathan? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a really good point because we risk otherwise widening, widening inequalities. And just to come in on one of the suggestions made in the piece of work which links to this, which was essentially to map the current provision of evidence-based public mental health interventions by all organisations across South London. And this was to estimate, first of all, the size, impact and cost of unmet need, but also um, what the gap in provision was for higher risk groups, because of course we need to be looking at those groups and looking at the gap in order to then be putting in actions to facilitate more targeted, targeted approaches um, to those groups. And I think linked to, um, I think, uh, the assessing of 
unmet need is also looking at what would be the impacts of improved population coverage, including to those groups, as well as the associated economic impacts, because we have to be living also aware of resources. And if we're able to highlight actually what would be the most effective inter in interventions to scale, including these groups, then I think we're, we're looking at opportunities to facilitate greater collaboration, not just within health, but with other sectors such as criminal justice, employers, um, educational settings. Thanks, Jonathan. And a point here from Daniel, who's commented, said there are no hard to reach communities. There are communities we've not listened to and communities we've not made the effort to engage with, which I think is an interesting point. Um, there's a question here that says uh, long term action plans tend to impress on the paper, but how are these going to help the groups mentioned? Surely it is down to resources, e.g. people and finances. So is there someone from the panel who'd like to come in on that one? I'm not sure I'll fully answer the, the, the resources and finance section, but I can, I can give that a go. But I, I, I wanted to come back on the, the point around um, hard, hard to reach communities or communities we haven't, we haven't engaged with effectively. And the point that Ernest Ermis was making around mapping, because I think there's something about often when we do mapping, it's because we're in, we're about to change something or we're in some kind of crisis that we need to do it. But actually, I, I think if we could do the mapping and build the relationships with each other and then sustain those relationships over a period of time, that then means that we don't need to have highfalutin complex action plans, but means we're naturally thinking with each other and naturally working with each other. We would have a much better output. And actually the finances and resources of the shared organisations together would enable us to be so much stronger as a community. But all of that, takes trust and relationship um, as well as a good highfalutin action plan and a map um, so i think it's probably i think it's pro i think it's strongly both um, and the need to invest time in it all the time not just when we want something from each other absolutely chris did you want to come in on this as well it's all right i can't see there she is thanks <laughs> Yeah, I, I think um, what we've been talking about in the group um, and across the task force is to really engage the local authorities who have got some resource and other partners and recognise the importance of the third sector. I mean, I take the point on uh, reaching out, hence why we've got the launch of the listening campaign today. And um, we've been doing quite a lot of that work in our communities. So um, we have got the resources. It's about targeting them. And as has been said really by Vanessa, we must work hard together all the time, not just when we're in a crisis, because I think that will make the difference in the long run. And that's what this is about. It's a long term joined up approach. It's not uh, whilst we are going through this pandemic, but we'd really like to build on it and make it last. Thank you very much, Chris. And uh, Sarah Lyle has posted in the chat a great point from Karina earlier about schools doing COVID safe workshops with with students, this could be part of the listening campaign, so really involving schools in that as well. Um, I'm going to go on to another question, and please, if the panel would like to come in on at any point, please just let me know. Um, and that's how are you actively going to listen, and what does listening mean to you? And I know that's quite a, that's quite a hard one to answer. Is there anyone from the panel who'd like to come in on that? Yeah, can Thanks. I can I just, um, also I think the comment that has been made in terms of long term plans and prevention um, being really challenging. I mean, we've been talking about prevention for a long time, but it is about the commitment. There are good models, for example, Southwest London and St. George's. I mean, their initiative, uh, re recent re initiative in terms of engagement with uh, black and minority ethnic communities, that's really one good model. But the same, um, mostly um, also South London and mostly is doing. So in terms of, um, you know, engaging with communities and, uh, when we say listening, it's just not one of listening, but it's about the relationship with the local communities. How much are we going to involve them in terms of designing our services, managing our services, monitoring, evaluating our services, but also capacity building of these communities in order for them to have a, a, you know, an increased resilience so that they can actually look after their own mental health and well-being. Thank you, Amias. Did anyone else want to come in on the point about listening? Norman, I, Olivia, I... can I come in? Sorry. 
Thanks. Hi, it's Amy. Um, so I think listening is a really interesting concept as well, because in order to properly listen, we have to accept that we may hear some things we don't want to hear. And that's, that's really, really important. It's not just listening in a tokenistic way and hoping that people say positive things or give us some suggestions for maybe improvement of things that we think are already quite good. It's really, really listening and accepting that if things aren't right, we may have to dismantle things. We may have to think very differently. We may have to ask ourselves, search quite deep within ourselves as individuals about thinking about our values and our approaches. And that, that can be um, anxiety provoking to an extent. It can make you feel very vulnerable. So I think, I think organizations do need to really think about not just listening, but actually being prepared to change and do things differently and, and doing the hard work actually. Um, if we listen, but we don't hear and we don't do anything, there's, there's just no point actually. There's, there's really no point. So yeah, it's not very passive, it's active. <laughs> Uh, and Olivia, I, I do agree with what Amy says there. We, we must be willing as organisations to accept that we may be getting things wrong uh, and to be prepared to change. Uh, and I think the really exciting aspect of this, I mean, as Jonathan has indicated, there's lots of evidence from around the world that uh, these approaches uh, to prevention work, that they are effective, that uh, you can stop people's health deteriorating, uh, protect people from mental ill health. Uh, and of course, then you're using your resources more effectively than we do uh, at the moment. And I think the really exciting thing is, first of all, we have a moral responsibility to do this, to listen to our communities, uh, to genuinely listen to them and act on what they tell us, uh, and then to implement uh, evidence-based approaches or to build the evidence ourselves of new approaches based on what we've heard from our communities and I think that we have the opportunity to be genuinely world leading here in South London. We, we could do something that is genuinely groundbreaking in supporting communities through these incredibly different circumstances that we now face uh, and protecting people from, uh, uh, fr from deteriorating health and everything that goes with it. So there's a real obligation on us, but the opportunity to pull something off quite exciting, I think is enormous. Thank you very much, Norman. And there's been a comment here uh, that empowering community members with knowledge, support, training and resources is a good starting point. Not everyone needs pills. If we are not brave enough to go into the spaces we don't know, then we'll not get any insight. That's why we need listening, training list, trained listeners and support to get the voices heard which is sort of what, what Amy and, and, and uh, Norman were saying. Um, I know there's, uh, I had a point and I've completely forgotten it in the, in the interest of being Olivia, could I, just, could I just add a point to what Norman was saying there? Just, um, just really linking to, to listening and I'm really echoing Norman's, um, you know, sort of um, highlighting this opportunity. We have an opportunity across South London to be groundbreaking, to actually meet all this unmet need um, and I think meeting that unmet need can also bring a, 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 about a, a discussion about what is acceptable level of coverage for treatment, for prevention, for promotion. What, what if we've got interventions we know work, we know also result in economic savings which can be estimated. We have a transparent dis discussion across all of the across all of the community and stakeholders about what is an acceptable level of coverage and, and I think that raises a certain um, you know is it 25 percent of people we should be treating or we should be preventing 30 percent of mental illness I, I think there's something about ambition here and I think this is part of listening as well thank you very much Jonathan um, a lot of people are mentioning about community resilience and I know there's sometimes um, uh, concerns about the way that resilience is used and resilience building and and and, and that kind of aspect is does anyone want to come in on on the topic of building community resilience i think it's to i think it's to sort of suggest that people uh people struggle to know what resilience is and recognize and recognize that i think that's what someone's saying here yeah can i comment yeah of course thanks Alice. yeah 
I think um, the word resilience is sometimes overused and uh, misinterpreted as well. It's not as if uh, you have resilience or you don't have it. It is depending on the circumstances, people may have really uh, an ability to cope with things uh, better or at some point and maybe less better at another point. So when we talk about resilience, we are talking about hope and aspiration and uh, self-esteem, uh, self-confidence. So it's about working again with communities then to build these things which um, impact uh, in different factors, obviously impact in terms of their mental health and well-being. So we need to address that concern. We need to listen to them. I mean, listening is here again. Uh, and by listening and by working together, then it's about capacity building and more empowering people. Thank you, Amias. And we've probably got about a minute, a minute and a half left. So, Chris, I was wondering if you wanted to come in to finish at all. Just to thank everyone, because those comments have really been pertinent and we want to carry on the work. So any more comments, really welcome. And yep. I mean, it is working with our communities. It's about networking and there are resources out there, but it's bringing them together so that really that old phrase, the sum of the parts is greater. You know, we, we want to have a whole system approach that really does work for our residents. Thank you very much, Chris. And Vanessa, did you have any final th thoughts? I think I just wanted to come back to the point on, on resilience and I'm, I'm at risk of uh, repeating myself, but I think we'll be much more resilient if we have relationships with each other, which allow us to make the connections and build the work. And I saw in the chat function, Karina uh, posted something about her children suffering from bullying at school and that pills were not the answer. And think small interventions like the, the mental health trailblazers where peer support workers have gone into schools and worked alongside people and raised a profile have meant that things feel, feel different, relationships are different. And I think that's what we've just got to keep, um, keep on investing in um, because the only way we're going to get through this is together. Thank you, Vanessa. Um, Alice has posted in the chat, she said, resilience is often related to how strong and mixed your connections with others are, as well as your own personal thought processes and personal resources. Um, and Dino has, uh, Dino has messaged that maximising community support networks through so social prescribing and genuinely listen to communities is going to be key. Um, so thank you to everyone for joining today. Um, we are due to uh, be pushed back into our main group very, very shortly. Um, I think we've posted a short survey in the chat function. Um, let me have a look. So at this point, we'd like to ask everyone to take two minutes to share some top line thoughts on the summit so far. I realise we're asking a lot of everyone. Um, so if you could, but if you could feedback, that would be really, really helpful. Um, we will be given, Angus, can you remind me what time we will be asked to rejoin the group? Uh, very any minute. Uh, we're down to rejoin at two ten, but I think we'll probably everyone will be given a few minutes just to finish that, fill out that survey. It shouldn't take more than a few minutes, and um, it should take you through to Microsoft Forms. And there's sort of six questions um, on the uh, ambition statements. That just leads me to say thank you to everyone so much for uh, for all your comments and all your input. It's been such a good conversation, and I'm sorry that not everyone has been able to see all of your comments, but but it's been really rich and very thoughtful. So thank you very much. And um, I will be quiet now, let you fill out the form and you should be getting a notification soon to send you back into the main breakout room. So um, thank you everyone. And I'll see you shortly. Thanks everyone. It's lovely to meet you all virtually. <laughs> thank you for joining us. I feel like we need to do some kind of little dance while we wait to be put back into some kind of room. I was particularly admired those people who had children and tried to concentrate juggling children and the event. I think you did an amazing job. <laughs> You're 10 times the person I am. I can't even make a cup of tea. <laughs> Excellent. Do you know how we access the, um, the form that uh, Angus was talking about. I think you just click on that link. Mm. You should take and it to the Microsoft form. I must have missed the link, the original link that he must have put out. Let me Hold on, it. sorry guys, I'll post it once more again for everyone. Oh, okay. I was looking for it in the chat box actually. <laughs> All right, okay, thank you. I think Angus is more, more worried that I might try and do something technical. <laughs> <laughs> there we go, that should be it again. 
Oh, Olivia's posted it as well. Brilliant. Uh, and I think the plan is to sort of, um, if people want to stick around at the very end of the summer, we'll have a look over everyone's feedback. Um, so this same survey is being shared with all the breakout rooms. Um, so we'll have a look at everybody's feedback at the very, very end. I think we need some lift music, Angus. We do need some lift music, yeah. I haven't brought my guitar, sorry everyone. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, while we're here, I mean, if anyone wants to come in and let us know what you thought on video, if anyone's brave enough to do that, we would love to love to hear your thoughts in person. Olivia, Melvin, Olivia, um, please come to me. Can I ask you a question? I'll put it on chat already. So it's just a question. Why isn't there anything about carers, about supporting carers? Because I'm curious to know how are you treating carers equally under the Care Act of 2015? You said about families, but not all carers are family members. So I'm just interested to know what are you doing to support carers? Thank you. Yeah, so, so Kevin, I think that's a really, um, Kelvin, I think that's a really important point that you raised there. I, I'm wondering if we use the word family in this because of the child element. So for many children, they won't have carers, they will have family family members that will support them and don't like the term carer. But I think it's a really, um, it's a, it's a really complex matter, isn't it? Because some people identify themselves as carers and, and the individuals don't identify them and other people. It's, it, but actually what we've got to remember, the, the term that I like is people, people who are supporting people with mental health. But, you know, whatever it is, it, it's about supporting and enabling the people who help you to stay well. And and I think I ask, oh, sorry. Well, why don't I ask this question? Because if you look under the Care Act of 2015, it says carers, and it uses the word carers, not supporters, like you're saying, yeah. should be treated equally. Yeah. Now, reading the numbers you've done doesn't look like you're breaking the law, aren't you? Because you're not treating carers equally because equally, you haven't included them in your yeah. uh, okay. meeting. That's how, that's how I'm looking at it. A carer's it's a really consultant. good challenge. Excellent challenge. One that we really need no, to think about. Don't be offended. I'm not criticising you. I'm just no. looking at that outside view as a carer. And you pick yeah. that up. You say, "Well, what about me? Who's supporting me? I'm a carer." And the other thing was there was nothing about older adults on that. You had younger carers. You had uh, children. What happened to the older adults? Yeah. Why aren't they included? Sorry, sorry to criticise. That is a criticism. Because I, I, well, I, I don't think it is. A, I don't think it is a criticism because this is what this whole exercise is about. <laughs> And your voice in making that point is very valuable. And, you know, uh, we've got to get more people uh, contributing their thoughts on it so that we make sure we get it right. Can I just make a comment? Uh, hello? Oh, hello? Hello, oh, yeah. um, My son, who's been, has, who has severe mental illness problems or challenges, is now in adult services. But um, we didn't realise that he was getting ill until he jumped off a balcony. We just thought he'd turned into a stroppy teenager. Um, but we did actually go into his school um, and they didn't have a clue. So I do feel that in schools there should be more than just... Uh, one person who's uh, mental health is who's a mental health first aider because if his either his tutor or his head of year had had a clue, we would have been able to access services before he um, went into a full psychotic episode because the symptoms were there. So, but I'm so sorry. This is the interpreter. I I can't hear. People must have sorry. their mics on or something. Can you hear me now? Did you hear any of it? Did you hear any of what I was saying? Yeah, yes. just, it was just getting more and more difficult. No, okay, yeah, so I do feel that there needs to be more training of teachers, not just one or two in each school, but I think nearly all teachers should have rudimentary mental health first aid training. Because certainly in our case, if one of his teachers had noticed something, we maybe could have accessed services before it turned into a full-blown uh, crisis and he had to be hospitalised. Thank you. So, oh, totally agree with what you're saying. Thank you for that contribution. Uh, I'm so sorry with what you've gone through.
Oh, it's all right. I mean, I'm still managing it and I'm still fairly actively involved. I'm on your involvement register. So well it's, done. Brilliant. Yeah. Anyway, thanks. Just, to t just on time, everyone, we've got about, I think, a minute or two minutes um, before we do get moved into the other room, just to flag. Can I just say, I mean, the point that Kelvin made, I think is a really valid point. And maybe it's, it's, it's about how we explain what we mean by the family or the nuclear family um, and, and widen it up. So, you know, Kelvin, it's not, we're not taking that as a criticism at all. I think you make a very valid point and it's something we will take away. I think Absolutely. So. And I know there's lots of people wanting to get in with comments now, um, but just to echo what Norman said, this is very much the start of a listening campaign. So the whole point is to provide much more time, much more space for everybody to have their say and to share these comments. So I do apologise that we don't have more time in this room now, um, but hopefully this is the first step on that journey. And all comments in the chat room will be, be, be recorded. So yes, I found Twitter to be a very good for forum for... Um, spreading the word. Thanks. Thank you everyone and we will, I think we'll just wait now for our, our breakout room is due to be closing any minute now. So thank you so much for your, for your feedback and your comments and I'm glad we could open the room up just to, to, to see actually your faces which is always a nice thing to do. Um, you know it puts real people behind the comments. Um, so if I just request that we all just uh, wait for the link, I'm assured it will be coming very soon. And I'll, I'll also say the chat, Olivia, so we will have a record of that. Thank you very much, Angus. And thank you, Olivia. <laughs> you are welcome. It's so nice to see so many people joining a big group conversation like this. <laughs>